Mm-hmm. And that is the spiritual issue. Yeah, no one man should have all this power. The clock's ticking, I'm the man of the hour. Feeling like Huey P and Stokely Carmichael in a Black Panther party with their hands on a rifle. This is revolution music to excite you. I send it to your all spark and hope that it is. 2000 at the turn of the 21st century that you can give children adult psychiatric medicines. See, one thing we got to understand about the Food and Drug Administration is that it's a big hoax. And many of the administrators who work for the FDA have financial stock vested in the very same drugs and foods that they're supposed to be protecting you from. So let me ask you a question. If I work for the FDA and someone's asking me to determine whether or not a certain drug should be used on children, and I know that if this drug is approved for use on children, this black folk who had absolutely nothing wrong with them were diagnosed as schizophrenia. Why? Because if you wanted to incarcerate, you would not be able to incarcerate through the justice system unless you have just cause. So in the mental health setting, you don't necessarily have to have just cause, you just have to have a belief that the black person is crazy. So any black person who believes that they have a right to overcome white supremacy is somehow insane. Then you gotta talk about the anti-spirituality of psychology. I often argue one of the reasons why the success rates of therapy for black folk is so low is because it does not incorporate our spiritual nature. You cannot deal with black people without dealing with the spirit. And that's why sometimes a religious counselor can be far more effective with a black client than someone with a doctorate degree. And 20 years experience, why? Because the spiritual counselor is dealing with the soul directly. Letting public school teachers tell you that your child has a mental disorder and needs medication when they can't even tell you the criteria for the disorder in the first place. <laughs> so the next time a teacher tells you your son needs drugs or has ADHD, you need to write a letter to the who? Superintendent of school and the chair of the school board and the secretary of education and your state senator and your state rep and the governor and the mayor letting them know that you have a teacher in this school who is operating outside of her boundaries of professional expertise. <laughs> the black community has to stop letting people just do whatever they want to do with us and do with our kids anything that they want. Because I'm getting sick and tired of the kids being blamed for the failure of the system. And see, there's a little secret about public education that nobody likes to talk about, but I'll bring it up. And that is this. When we talk about black boys don't want to learn, you got to operationalize that lie. It's not that they don't want to learn. They don't want to learn at the hands of middle class white women, many of whom don't give a damn about their future. We got to be honest. I'm in the schools. If we want to fix the problems that's affecting black boys, you got to give them black male teachers. If you give every black boy a black male teacher, a strong black male teacher, you cut suspension in half. A strong black male teacher, you cut learning disability diagnosis in half. You cut mild mental retardation in half. You cut exposure in half. You cut the need for drugs in half. So if we know that all we got to do is put a black man in front of the black boys, why aren't we doing it? It's because the school system is designed to feed the prison system. The school systems are designed to feed the prison system. And if you look at the budget of the prison in any state, if you look at the budget of the schools, the prisons in most states get twice as much as the schools get. See, remember now, the reason you got public education in the first place was for what? The reason public education evolved in the 19th century into what it has become is because big business needed a low-wage earner who could do basic reading, basic writing, and basic math. But guess what? Once they start shipping industries to third world countries, and once they start snatching the factories out of the black community, there was no longer any factories for us to get jobs at. So when there was no longer an economy for the low wage earner, what did the goal of public education become then? The goal of public education became two things, for black girls to prepare them for a life of poverty and for black boys to prepare them for a life of prison. And that's why I tell the black communities, we can keep on playing games with the school district all day, but you must do one or two things to save our sons. Number one, take over the school system, or number two, build your own schools. One or the other, there's nothing else. See, people often say, I want some strategies. We want some solutions. You know what the solution is. Problem is you don't love your children enough to bring about that solution. And that solution is independent schools. 
Because if you notice, black folk, you love to spend your money on anything except the right thing. You love to spend your money to have fun, but you don't love to spend your money to do right for the great good of the whole race. Hey. Come on, mm -hmm. right. Now, when we talk about propaganda, and propaganda is a major issue when you're talking about psychology. Okay, you got to talk about propaganda, the science of mind control. Marcus Garvey told us that the world was run by propaganda. Half the stuff you believe was nothing but a lie. Right. Okay? What did Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda minister, say about brainwashing people? What did Goebbels say? Goebbels said that if you want to control the way people think, he said, keep the lie simple. Keep the lie big. And keep saying it over and over again. Let me say it again. This is what they done. He said, keep the lie simple. Keep the lie big and keep repeating it. He said, it's something within the nature of man, no matter how much you're lying to him, he has to believe it if you keep on saying it. So, when we look at television, we find that AOL, Tom Warner, and Disney are the two largest media corporations in the world. Did you know that? Yeah. When most of us think of Disney, we think of Mickey Mouse and Buzz Bunny. No. But Disney, okay, is one of the most powerful media corporations in the world. There's only five corporations that control 95% of everything you see on TV, listen to on the radio, or read out the bookstore. Five of them. AOL, Tom Warner, and Disney are at the top. Then you have Bertelsmann, Viacom, and Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation. Mm -hmm. These are the five giants. Did you know that the FBI and CIA by themselves publish over 18,000 magazines and books every year? Filled with misinformation. What did we learn from Goebbels? Goebbels said that in a country ruled by lies, the truth is the moral enemy of the state. In a country ruled by lies, differences in psychology. Francis Galton was cousin to Charles Darwin. Francis Galton coined the term eugenics, which means good stock. He said that, that Europeans need to do what? Eliminate the genotype of any other race that threatens their own, or otherwise they might bring down the general intelligence of their own people. So psychology gave birth to racial extermination. So when you look at an IQ, for example, you got the full scale IQ, right? And then you got your subdomains. You got your working memory index. You got your verbal comprehension index. You got your nonverbal reasoning index. And then you got your mental processing speed, right? So this is overall IQ. And then you got your four IQ areas working memory, verbal comprehension, nonverbal reasoning, and mental speed. Now, when you look at the processing speed of black children compared to white and Asians, it's average. If you look at the working memory of black children compared to white and Asians, it's average. When you look at the nonverbal reasoning scores of black children compared to white and Asian, it's average. But when you talk about the verbal comprehension, are y'all listening to me? That's when we drop. So it's not that black children are less intelligent than other children. They don't understand the verbal concepts that, on the, that are on the test, which are deliberately chosen to be difficult for black children to perpetuate the stereotype of racial inferiority. Psychiatric medicine. Did you know that in the 1960s, the United States government funded a long-term study to see what the ultimate side effects would be on the community that was doped into submission? See, the reason you got crack cocaine is because of what? The black power movement. Yeah. In the 1970s, right. the government said, look, we can't keep on dealing with these black radicals at home as long as we try to go and steal oil and drugs in other countries. So we got to find a way to keep these black folks docile. So somebody said, why don't we do to the black community the same thing the British did to the Chinese? Don't blow up. And so they came in with crack cocaine. Crack cocaine was one of the most effective weapons used against the black community. How does it operate? Because if you got to worry about somebody climbing in your back window, stealing your television for a $5 bag of crack, how are you going to go to the political meeting to organize and get some pressure? Are y'all listening to me? Yeah. Crack cocaine disorganizes the black community. And as long as you are disorganized, you can't organize. Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture told us what? The reason we don't get anywhere is because we're not organized. The parents are not organized. Black men are not organized. Black women are not organized. <coughs> Black psychologists aren't as organized as we should be. Black medical doctors are not as organized. The criminologists, the social workers, the medical doctors, we're not as organized as we should be because to be organized is to be effective. To be organized is to be effective. 
Kwame Ture said if you organize a lot, you get a lot done. If you organize a little, you get a little bit done. But if you don't organize at all, you don't get anything done. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Gawdy said what? The greatest weapon used against the Negro is disorganization. So you see, we got to recognize that there's people making billions of dollars off of black disorganization. I mean, look how many people whose houses and lives were financing in the suburbs because we refused to get our act together. How much money are doctors making off of these brain trusts? How much money are the halfway houses making? How much money are the therapy centers making off oh, black folk who can't solve their own problem? So if you look at it, there's so much money invested in you doing wrong, why in the hell would anybody want to do right? It's just like special education. Whenever I diagnose one of your children and put them in special education, the school, the district is what? Double the money from the federal government. Did you know that every time a child goes on special education, there's a 100% increase in funding for that baby? So for example, in Los Angeles County, let's say the average child gets $9,000 spent on their education. The minute Dr. Umar Johnson says he got a learning disability, or he's autistic, or he's emotionally disturbed and mentally retarded, instead of getting 9000 special ed kids worth 18000 Do y'all see that? Special ed is a business. It is the business of making money off miseducation. And guess what? Half the kids who are diagnosed with SLD, specific learning disability, don't have an SLD, they have an ABT. ABT is a label that I made up. You know what it stands for? Mm. Ain't been the hell talk. Are oh, y'all listening to me? He ain't been the hell talk. He's in fifth grade still reading on the second grade level. Do you want to know why? Because the second grade, they suspended him so much that he wasn't in class long enough to learn anything. In first grade, the teacher was on patern maternity leave half the school year, and he was flooded with six or seven different substitutes for the rest of the year. In kindergarten, he had a teacher fresh out of college who couldn't tell if she was sleeping or awake. <laughs> Are y'all listening to me? So why is he being put in special education? He ain't been taught. So people say, what should we do then? I mean, these kids are behind, Dr. Umar. What is your recommendation? If you don't want to put them in special ed, what should we do? Do what you get to do in the first place, teach them. The problem is there's no money to get children up to where they're supposed to be. The money is in so the misdiagnosis. Right. I know this for a fact. The money is in the misdiagnosing. Do you know what most school districts do in jail? They get all their psychologists together, they have a big meeting. Yes. And everybody pulls out a list of all the kids they misdiagnosed for the year. And the school district goes through the list to make sure they didn't miss any names. Why? Because they want to make sure they don't lose out on none of that money coming from Obama. It is a hustle. And another reason why we see so few black children being diagnosed as mentally gifted is because MG has been taken out of the special ed law. MG is no longer a diagnosable condition under IDEIA, which means what? When I diagnose a kid as gifted, there's no extra money. So who is going to bother looking for black mentally gifted kids if they're not going to be paid for doing it? This is the situation. Miseducation. Absolutely ridiculous. Our boys are systematically miseducated. My good colleagues, Dr. Nathan and Julia here, say that a lot of our children participate in psychological dropout. And guess what? We fail to realize that there's really no such thing as a dropout rate in America when it comes to black children. There's only a black push-out rate. Our kids are pushed out by the treatment that they get. They are castrated psychologically and emotionally. They are degraded. They are treated like animals. And guess what else we find? And this is supported by the research. The darker the boy, the darker the boy, and the thicker his hair, the more likely he is to be suspended. Self-esteem damage because my grandmother or grandfather never takes me out. They only take my little brother or my big brother because they got good hair and light skin. We got to stop doing that, black folk. Stop worshiping skin tone. I don't care if you're butter pecan or vanilla or chocolate. We all beautiful. And we got to recognize the reason why we got all these different colors and shades anyway because we even got all mixed up with other people. And some of us are still psychologically mixed up with other people. Okay? An African is an African, whether they got one black parent or two. So that includes our biracial brothers and sisters. They are ours as well. They ain't got nowhere else to go. They belong to us. And I'm trying to push them away. And when I talk about light-skinned supremacy, I'm not talking about light-skinned people because most of the light-skinned supremacists I know are, are dark-skinned, blue, black, purple. <laughs> Clarence Thomas is dark as can be. But Clarence Thomas is a light-skinned supremacist. You don't see nobody around him if they don't pass the brown paper bag test of that. In fact, did you know that Clarence Thomas was married to George Bush's cousin? 
Do you know that Connor Thomas married Rush Limbaugh in his own house? He happens to be an ordained minister. The most selling black man in America is a minister. Let that tell you something. Let's talk about the black aristocracy. One of the side effects of the civil rights movement was that it gave birth to a class of educated, well-placed black people who are used to keep the rest of you in your place. I'm not from Los Angeles, but I'm willing to bet that you got a black aristocracy, mm -hmm. a talent of the a clique of Negroes who think they're better than every other Negro, but who serve the interests of the social order. And there's five families within that black aristocracy. I don't use black bourgeoisie that much because bourgeoisie is a Marxist term that speaks about wealth. They don't own any wealth. They just make a lot of money. Do you follow me? Yeah. Okay. When we got out of slavery, we owned what? One half of one percent of all the wealth in America. Today, with all of our Oprah Winfrey's and Bill Cosby's and basketball players, we still only own one half of one percent of all the wealth in America. We have to acquire industries and we have to acquire institutions. Those are the two things that black people need. Where are your supermarkets? Where are your airlines? Where are your submarines? Where are your distribution companies? Why is Michael Jackson dead right now? The reason Michael Jackson is dead is Michael Jackson was plotting to build America's first major black independent music label. Because you don't have one. Rockefeller's not independent, that belongs to Universal. G Unit is not independent, that belongs to Interscope. You ain't got no black independent labels. And Michael Jackson owned what? Michael Jackson owned 100% of the Beatles catalog. So every time you listen to a Beatles song or buy a Beatles album, Michael Jackson got paid. And so somebody wanted that catalog back, called Sony Records. They wanted the catalog back, and Mike said, I'm not giving you the catalog back. So somebody made Mike a deal to go on tour. And Mike said, I'm going to go on tour. 20 concerts, they sold out overnight. They said, wait a minute, this man might still got the bus he has 50 years ago. So they said, would you mind doing 30 more? He said, sure. So now Mike got 50 concerts. Had Mike been able to do his concerts, he would have made enough money to pay off the debt he owned Sony and keep the Beatles catalog. So the only way to get that Beatles catalog from Michael Jackson was to kill him before he went on tour. And that's exactly what they did. Michael Jackson is dead is because as a black man, he owns the rights to the most popular white group in American history, which is an absolute sin and white supremacy code. That's it. So what are the five families? You got black folk in entertainment who miseducate through music. You got black folk in movies, and you got black folk in education. These are the PhDs, the PsyDs, the MDs, the JDs. We don't do nothing in the H double O Ds. <laughs> then you got status and they gross. High place, right? I'm the chief of police. I'm the chair of the school. I'm the president of this. I'm the overseer of that. It doesn't mean I mean ten more. Airborne International, welcome to the flight club I'm far from your average nigga hanging in a nightclub I'm like Al Pacino, sitting in the hot tub Arguing with wifey cause she can't stay out the nightclub She's so addicted to the power of the evil Like a crack addiction to the power of the needle I say she has the power of the most powerful people But if you want that bullshit, that power will leave you You are royalty, behave like a queen do Overstand that nonsense uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to find out if you guys have anything uh, coming up in the next few days um, here in Los Angeles, any speaking occasions that I could put down on the list for all of you. Brother Ryan, tomorrow is a conference here, correct? Yes. Okay, so tomorrow well, here. Tomorrow afternoon, correct? From 1 to 2 30. It starts at 9. It starts at 9. Oh, she said 10 to 4, right? She said 9 to 4. 9 to 4. It's the conference tomorrow. I know I'll be presenting specifically from 1 to 2 30. I'll be doing a presentation that I didn't offer tonight. And then there'll be another panel discussion from 2 30 to 4, which I'll also be a part of. So 1 to 4 tomorrow for me. But the whole thing, 9 to 4. I'll be on the panel tomorrow afternoon, and I don't know what time, but I'm probably sometime like the time. I can't even do it. And I'm speaking on Tuesday at Cal State LA uh, to county um, staff and officials um, on this issue of disproportionality. 
but I would invite all of you to, um, in July of this year, I'm the national president of the Association of Black Psychologists. And, thank you. And um, our organization's annual convention um, will be here in Los Angeles at the Western Hotel near LAX. And we want to have special workshops for the community and for local practitioners, et cetera. So I do invite you all to visit our website and to come out and participate with us in our convention. Diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and boy, it took years to be able to really be able to say that without shame, right? So, um, and so my son is on quite a few medications. And my question to you is, you spoke a lot, um, Dr. Omar? Um, you spoke a lot about um, misdiagnosing children. Um, but what is your perspective on a child who may actually have ADHD? Because I do see uh, quite a bit of need for help with getting him to do the things he needs to do, concentrating and that kind of thing. What do you, are you saying, because you were talking about giving diagnoses and being careful of getting them, are you saying that you should, the diagnoses do, do not help them? I'm a little confused if you have a child who is legitimately diagnosed properly, um, how do you help him not to just be labeled and not getting the help that he needs within the school system? Okay, if a child is diagnosed, first when you talk about the legitimacy of the label, that's always open to speculation because all psychological diagnoses are open to speculation. And the one thing we have to understand is every psychological diagnosis is a professional opinion. We understand that, right? Too often we treat them as facts. They're not facts. They can change. Yeah. The three of us can evaluate the same child. I might say it's an adjustment disorder. She may say it's ADHD. The good system may come up with something else. Okay, so it's always a professional opinion. The problem comes when we tell the child that this is what you have. Now it becomes a personality variable. They take it on. It develops into a self-fulfilling prophecy. So yesterday, the young man was trying to improve his behavior. He was having difficulty, but he was trying. Today, he stopped trying. Why? Because we just told him he got a mental disorder that he has no control over. So when I asked him, why is he running down the hallway today? Instead of saying, Dr. Umar, I'm going to try a little bit better, he says, I didn't take my pill. So what we're doing by doing that is we're creating a whole generation of black boys who are not taking responsibility for their behavior, which is going to have consequences when they become young men because the police could care less about your labor or the fact that you didn't have the medicine. Now, here's the thing. I do a lot of work around behavior therapy, okay? You can solve a problem with drugs, okay? Or you can solve it by teaching that child how to behave. The reason why pharmacotherapy, which is the nice word for drugs, is more popular than behavior therapy is because behavior therapy takes commitment and work. See, when I go to somebody's house and they say, well, look, my child is uncontrollable, okay, uh, too much head attention, too much hyperactivity, we're going to sit down, we're going to deal with the triggers, we're going to do a whole functional assessment of behavior, we're going to come up with a positive behavior plan because you need punishments and rewards. I want to see how consistent you are because the biggest reason why we don't change children's behavior is because we're not consistent. And I tell teachers all the time, because teachers got a bad habit of calling you guys, and I don't know if your son was diagnosed off of the influence of a teacher or purely you, but there's three criteria for ADHD that often go ignored. The first one is the ADHD should be affecting that child in some area of life. Okay, whether it's school, whether it's home, whether it's community, you should see some evidence of effect. A lot of ADHD kids, I don't see no evidence of effect nowhere. Okay, they're doing well in school, they don't get in trouble in the hood, they're all right at home. And then the symptoms should have been present before the age of seven. You should have saw some of this stuff. So you got a kid in fifth grade getting medicine for the first time and there was never an issue about his behavior. Is it really the child? But to make a long story short, what I would do if I were working with you is I would work with you to change his behavior through behavioral shaping procedures. That's the way you do it because now he's learned how to change and that will be with him forever as opposed to the drug which is a band-aid. You can stop giving him the drug and then he might experience what we call a rebound effect which is when the symptoms for which the drug were originally prescribed come back 20 times worse. So and the side effects, the side effects, it stunts the growth, epilepsy, diabetes, schizophrenia, tics, um, heart, stroke, the sexual dysfunction, sexual impotence. I had a young man, he has seminal fluid,
coming out of his privates while he was playing basketball. He don't know where it came from. He wasn't sexually aroused. It was the medicine. So we got to be careful. So, you know, again, behavior modification principles. And I can talk with you more about that. Speaking of Dr. Umar, um, I heard uh, of a person named Sir Ken Robinson who was speaking, uh, a British guy, was saying some of the same things that you're saying. Um, also, I've been studying this guy named Howard Gardner who had, came up with this philosophy of um, multiple intelligences. And it was, it's, a, it's a, like a, a school that teaches people, I'm sure, you might, I'm sure you might be aware of it. I have yet to find any schools like that where I would like my kids to go to. I live here in LA. Um, are there any schools that teaches kids the way that to the individual skills outside the public school system that is affordable? Well, you got the Marcus Garvey School here. Okay. You got the Garvey School. Here's the thing I want to say about education, though. Education must have a goal. And we're not teaching children simply so they can be full of knowledge or wisdom. It must be in a certain direction. So the black community has to ask itself, what is the purpose of education for our children? What do we want every black boy or girl to be able to do by the time they're 16 or 18? Okay, are we educating them to be good, effective handlers of power? Or are we educating them to fit into the American social order that has no place for them? And one of the biggest problems with public education, it's designed for them to fit into the American social order that has no place for them. So we gotta rethink our entire approach to education, which is why I bring up those six sciences, because when I approach education, and I'm gonna open my own school one day, hopefully soon, the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Pan-African School for Black Boys, okay? And it's gonna focus on those six sciences, because I don't just want them to be able to get a job in America. I want them to be able to go anywhere in the world and become a controller and connoisseur of power. Do y'all follow where I'm coming? No one man shall have all this power The clock's ticking, I'm the man of the hour Feeling like M. Hotel creating medicine Giving cures to people for disease that lie ahead of them I am on some different shit, I am in a different realm 